So hi there. Hi. I'm Tibbs. Um, you may have seen me speak yesterday about crypto mysteries. Today we're going to talk about social contracts and mechanics underlying uh, social engineering. Um, as I said yesterday, um, I'm available at What a Tiberius and uh, by email. And I love getting tweets. I love being able to storyfy my uh, my talk. So if you're a tweeter, feel free, um, even if it's something bad. Um, <laughs> so uh, about me, I am just changing contracts from working with PGE to working with Intel. Um, I'm going to be reviewing the uh, and doing uh, security assessments on the open source projects that they use in the company. Really excited about that. Uh, I'm originally from Scotland. I moved here to the States about a year ago. I'm based up in Portland, Oregon. And uh, it's been a really interesting experience. And I've loved being able to go to different conferences and, and talk to people about uh, security, which is my passion, probably like you. Um, I'm also a huge Supernatural fan. Now, if you're not familiar with the show, you may not get a lot of the jokes because this whole talk is Supernatural themed. Um, so Supernatural is like Scooby-Doo for adults. Um, it's a lot of fun. And uh, my friend actually challenged me to make this talk Supernatural themed. And of course, like any fangirl, my answer was bring it. So if you don't like Supernatural, bear with me. It is mildly relevant. Also, writing is hard. So our story starts not with Supernatural, but with Socrates. In 399 BC, Socrates was put on trial for two things, moral corruption and impiety. It's a really, really interesting story. Um, it happened, it's, it's history, and it's really interesting. You should go read the whole story. I can't cover it all here, but I assure you there's a lot of curious facts surrounding it. But the outcome of the trial was that Socrates was convicted and he was sentenced to death by um, hemlock poison. Now Plato, one of his students, recorded that Socrates had both the opportunity and the means to escape punishment and leave Athens. Despite encouragement from his friends and his students, Socrates chose to stay in Athens and die. He refused because it would mean leaving what he saw to be a legal obligation to the city of Athens. He believed that having lived there, he, was subject, he subjected himself to the possibility that he might be found guilty of a crime and punished. And to run away would be to break the social contract that he made with the state and its people. Now, this story is, is really meaningful, but it leaves us with some questions. We're aware of explicit contracts, employment contracts, loan agreements, marriage contracts, these contracts we knowingly negotiate and enter. I mean, some could argue that you're never really prepared for marriage, but that's neither here nor there. And social contracts provide a framework, or sorry, yeah, whereas social contracts provide a framework for how society and government interact. In Socrates' words, they're an agreement between the people of a society to abide by the laws and accept punishment. So, what does that actually mean? Well, many philosophers have expanded on Socrates' social contract theory. Socrates, Hobbes, Locke, and Rousseau may have argued about schematics, but, or some <laughs> semantics even, but they all agreed that we who live in a society implicitly and sometimes unknowingly agree to enact and expect the completion of social contracts. When they were developing the theory, morality and politics were thought to be interlinked, and they still kind of are. Rulers were to govern fairly, and people were to help society. Social contracts are not just an agreement between the people and their government, but they're also unspoken rules that govern polite society and maintain civility in the absence of the direct application of law. Social contracts are often born of religious beliefs and morals. These rules are the glue that holds a society together. Often we think of them as doing what's polite or the right thing, such as tipping wait staff or holding the door open for somebody who has their arms full, or even not standing too close to somebody at the ATM. 
It's never really a spoken rule, but everybody understands that that's what you do. Psychology couches this concept, or couches this in the concept of moral development. Moral development is the stages of moral reasoning that we go through as we turn from children into adults. This looks at how people justify their behaviors rather than ranking how, someone's, how moral someone's behavior is. These stages are grouped into three levels, and stages of development can't be skipped. You have to progress through one to get to the other. Levels one and two are pre-conventional stages, and these are normally seen in children. Three and four are conventional stages, and these are normally seen in adolescents and adults. Level five and six are post-conventional level stages, and these are marked by a growing understanding that individuals are separate, but part of society. People at this stage of development view rules as useful, but changeable. So what we're talking about here is something that is kind of intuitive to being a person within society. People don't ever normally really examine the workings of society in the ways that we're talking about here. But my argument is that social engineers should. Along with subterfuge, body language, and psychology, social engineers need to understand society, the society and culture of the target that they're trying to manipulate. We understand the social contracts which underline our, our own society because we're part of it. But what about others? I moved from Scotland to America, and I noticed huge differences. I mean, in Scotland, all socialization, it happens in a pub. Everything, from work nights to talks with your boss, everything. Um, also, British people love a good queue, and there are strict, unspoken rules that govern how a queue moves and works, whether you hold somebody's place or not. Those rules don't exist in American lines, and I was entirely unprepared for this. I still find it curious that guys here hold the door open for women to walk through. That doesn't happen in Britain at all. I could go on. There's lots of examples. But these are two really quite similar cultures. We share a language and history to some degree. I mean, I think it's fair to say we both have a problem with English. So can you imagine trying to carry out a social engineering attempt in a country with vastly different social contracts? Research is important, not just of your target, but of the culture that that target is in. So how do social contracts work in an environment where people are coming from different languages and societies, where people interacting don't know the same unspoken rules? Unless somebody explicitly creates and enforces rules, generally it's chaos. I mean, case in point, the internet. It's a hodgepodge, and everybody does what they want. Small groups form rules for their own websites or message boards and spaces, but the internet at large is pretty lawless. Lack of physical space makes it really easy for people to behave in ways that they wouldn't in real life because in real life they're constrained by social contracts. So things like trolling and harassment and doxing happen. Social engineering relies on subverting the social contracts of a given society. It works because social engineers exploit known weaknesses within social contracts to encourage people to fill, fulfill their side of the social contract even when it's against their interests. So I'm going to talk about some examples here. We all know of phishing attacks. I mean, they're probably the most prominent and common example of social engineering that we currently have. They're a really hot topic right now. It's common because it works. Because the creators of the technology used to carrying out phishing attacks did not consider how people might subvert that technology and mis misuse it. I recently worked for a company who had a, a guy come in claiming to be a contractor, and he was given a temporary pass, and he was in the building for three days before anybody thought to question this. Turned out he wasn't a contractor, and in those three days he made off with a lot of hardware. Hardware that was valuable in and of itself, but that hardware also had confidential data on it that was also worth quite a lot. In this case, we don't expect somebody to come up to reception and say, hi, I'm supposed to be here. 
when they're not supposed to be here. So it's, it's a really good example of this use of social contracts. And a little bit topical, I'm not going get, to get too into it, but um, a little bit topical is another example of social engineering on a grand scale that we're, faking to, that we're experiencing today. And that's fake news. In theory, organizations who report news should be neutral. They should be reporting only the facts. But over the last decade, this is, this is developed into providing maybe selective truths, adding a bias to stories reported, or choosing not to report stories that don't support a chosen narrative. In the last few years, this has progressed to reporting outright fabrications as news. Now, these stories are picked up and spread, becoming kind of a consensus truth. And when repeated by people in positions of power, they get credence and gravitas. The, truth of, the truthiness of these stories is not necessarily the point here. However, news outlets have always purported to tell the news as it happens. So they're actually starting to twist and break the social contracts on which the basis for trusting a news source is based. The purpose behind this, as with any social engineering attempt, is to get a person or people to act in a way which they normally wouldn't. To recap, social contracts underlie society. Without them, it would collapse. We'd have chaos, anarchy. Everybody would be working in their own best interests. But we still have people who routinely subvert them for their own benefit, which, I mean, to some degree is a little understandable. So, so what? What does that mean for us as security professionals and developers of technology? Being aware and understanding the oddities of human behavior gives us a tremendous opportunity an opportunity to do what we are uniquely qualified to do, to look at new technology and how people should interact with it, then find the vulnerabilities. Finding the ways that people can exploit it. Not just technically, but socially, and highlight that to the creators, the curators, and the users of that technology. So my call of action to you, audience, is this. Break stuff. But don't just break it technically. Look at how you can break it socially and talk about it. Work with creators to find a better way for, fall for fallible people to interact with emerging technologies. Plug the social gaps and make the world a better place. Also, watch more Supernatural. Thank you so much. You've been a very quiet but good audience. I really appreciate it. Does anybody like Sam have questions? You in the front. Um, <laughs> I, I think that one of the best things that you can do is is actually live within a culture. I mean, there are things that I never would have understood about American society without having actually been here and lived here. I mean, in Scotland, if you'd asked me about sectarianism, which is a whole complication of... Um, isms between uh, Protestant and Catholic people who have been at each other's throats for decades, I could have given you a whole talk just on that subject. But when I landed on the ground in America, I never would have anticipated or understood the racism and other issues, social issues, of this country that change the way that people react to things. There are statements that you could make in Britain that you just couldn't make here because they would be really offensive. Whereas in Britain, we wouldn't think two times about it. So living within that culture, learning their language, even just a little bit, and trying to get into the mindset of somebody from that culture is a really good place to start. Studying their history is, is also a great place. Hmm.
I entirely agree. <laughs> mm. It often feels to me like each state in America is almost like its own little country. There's just all these little differences, and it's, yeah, even, yeah, that's a very good point. Thank you. Sorry? Yeah. Yeah, I think that a company's culture, uh, I was just going to say that I think that a, a company's culture very much uh, changes the way that the people within that company um, think about things. And it's certainly something to consider when looking at engineering within a company. Does anybody else have any questions? Um, so I don't know if everybody heard that. The question was that holding a door open for a woman, he thought, was a British tradition. And I would, I would say that much like the Oxford comma, which apparently is commonly used here, um, we've kind of let that slide a bit. Um, people hold the door open for each other, but there's not this kind of uh, thought process that I have to hold the door open for a woman or that I'll wait until she goes through before I follow her. It's, it's, just, it's just different. I mean, it's not necessarily bad, it's just different. Any other questions? Back. Oh, do you? All right, okay, so maybe it's just us Scots who are barbarians. Apologies about the English comment earlier, by the way. <laughs> All right, anybody else? Great, well, thank you very much for uh, sticking with me. Cheers.